Nice one. Hello and welcome everyone to episode two of the Beacons of Kelestri. I am Eric, aka Eldritch Crow, your host and narrator, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, we made it. We made it through the first episode, and the second one only had minor tactical things restream. <laughs> it's fine. Um... So today, as always, for any newcomers in chat, we are playing a house-written uh, TTRPG by yours truly called Ether. Um, if you use the command exclamation point TTRPG, you'll find a link to that. And um, as always, the stream is brought to you by uh, RPG Hour Studios, who are producing. Let me just go see if I can get my chat com up. And I hope that command works. There we go. So you can go find RPG Hour Studios and their other shows there. And uh, later on, you'll be hearing some soundboards by Sirenscape, who are adding a little bit of ambiance to our episode today as well. That said, uh, let's go around and introduce the players. Um, Starting with me, because I believe that is what is on the docket for today. So, hi. Yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> um, I feel like I'm going to have to start a tradition here, and I apologize in advance. It's me, your resident fanboy, <laughs> Zinziak. I kind of hate you. <laughs> I love okay. it. <laughs> yeah, let's just, um, I'm going to fix this a little bit. My name is Zinziak. My pronouns are he him. Um, my character in this game is Brew, whose pronouns are he, they. You can find me around the Twitter and the Twitch place, mostly by the same name in both those places, where you will find me talking about um, why I love Final Fantasy Tactics and Sailor Moon and things that I enjoy about the design of tabletop games. And we're playing multiplayer games from being salty at crow for lying once again in the realm of Revelon. I had Rue's pronouns wrong. Thank God for quick switches. Uh, next up, I believe, would be Rainy. Yes, hi, it's me, your resident chaotic gremlin, goblin, whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm Rainy. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I am playing uh, Alyssa Vesper, whose pronouns are also she, her. With a little bit of they, maybe sprinkled in. Just, 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 a, just a teensy bit. Just a spice. Is there enough and spice for me to go change not. the overlay? No, not yet. Okay. Um, and... I do things like art, and that's about it. And you can also find uh, Rainy streaming on occasion uh, as well. Either yeah. art or Guild Wars too. Sure. Row, you're up. <laughs> All right. Hey, y'all. I'm Monroe, your resident thrift witch, and um, <laughs> my pronouns are he, he, him, they, them, interchangeably. And I play Danica, whose pronouns are she, they, interchangeably. And um, you can just find my general TTRPG content and general by foolery on Twitter at MonroeRow98. Hello, I'm a Ninbin. You may find me at Ninbins on Twitter. I'm currently planning things to do with waves. Um, I'm also playing today a very fun uh, tree person by the name of Barry. I hope you have fun. Thank you, thank you. And so let's roll into a bit of a quick recap. Last time, y'all were enjoying a bit of a break in the town of Twin Creeks, as those of you who work for the Gleam Bordens, a company of protectors, defenders, and researchers, were coming back from an expedition past, well, their home area of the Shattered Plateau. We were about three days out from the plateau itself. You could see it off in the distance. And you were being led by one named Zero Darkfang. Now, you all were going about your various business in about mid-afternoon when Rue 
walked into town after awakening in a bit of a, um, I wouldn't say disoriented state, but um, definitely an interesting one. Yes, definitely an interesting one. Uh, hold on. I have to fix our captions. They're getting cut off a little bit. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. Overlay things. Um, that said, uh, Rue was walking through town when he encountered a very particular precognitive vision of a plume of smoke rising on the edge of the city. Not very long after that, panic ensued as a half-fire giant covered in growths of black crystal walked out of the smoldering remains of a building while our group of heroes watched on and realized the Bane Horde had arrived in town and Alyssa realized that the town's protective beacon which warded off these crystalline creatures was missing. Quickly taking action, you all managed to uh, take out an advanced party of the Bane Horde with various magics, amazing arrow shots, and um, one very well-placed pit uh, by Barry, who managed to... Uh, Technically two very well-placed pits. <laughs> <laughs> Technically two. Uh, one right other on top of the other. Yep, uh, who managed to bury a uh, half-giant in a 30-foot deep hole. And then close it on top of him with a few of his friends. And that said, um, you all managed to successfully evacuate the town without a loss, actually. And now you all are sort of taking the three-day trip back to the plateau. And that is where we find ourselves. Heading back with a, basically a caravan of about 200 people from this very small village. And so we begin our journey. Now, Rue, you don't dream this time. It is the first day out from the town, which you assume can't be doing very well after being rolled through by the Bane Horde. As indicated by a certain set of explosions that we heard as we left. <laughs> very true. Uh, set by uh, our prolific mage, Barry. And for the first time in what feels like forever, you awaken and are a bit perhaps shocked, perhaps surprised by the fact that you are still in the back of a wagon. What would you like to do? Hmm. Well, um, this might not necessarily be the weirdest thing in the world. I've woken up in trees and other things. Um, hmm. This is a bit direct, maybe to the point. Why am I, why have I just appeared in a wagon this time? And eh, well, I guess we'll see what's outside. What's outside? Well, you open your eyes and it's not really a covered wagon. It's, um, it was basically a farmer's cart that they would use to bring things to market. And you awaken, you roll over, and you can see a bright sky above you. And getting closer is sort of this looming wall of the plateau that you saw across the distance from Twin Creeks. Do I see, like, do I see any familiar people or landmarks other than this plateau? Very much so. In fact, when you sit up, you look around and you realize you are on the road towards the plateau that led north out of Twin Creeks. And looking around, you recognize quite a few faces because these were faces that surrounded you the evening prior as you fell asleep. And in fact, this is the same wagon in which you fell asleep. Well, this is the longest sleep I've had since, you know, like in forever. Normally, 
I wake up in the woods when I'm sleeping. Hmm. Now, what do you think are usually the common indicators for Rue besides being in the woods? You know, how, how do you think Rue clues into when he's experiencing someone else's dream or just a dream in general instead of just wandering the woods himself? Things like... Um... Your sense of touch is probably like dulled a little bit, you know, as vivid as those feelings can be. Like uh, it's different. Things move slower. The time of day doesn't uh, like changes at a much slower rate of things. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time for me, other people don't notice me unless I interact with them. Okay, so that said, as you kind of sit up and you say out loud, perhaps, or perhaps think to yourself, this is the longest sleep you've encountered for a while. The uh -huh. driver of the cart turns to you and says, Oh, well, look who finally woke up. You slept in a bit. How are you doing? And you see, it's this sort of older, um, <laughs> looks a bit like a cross between a Moogle and uh, Ori from Ori in the Blind Forest, uh, a former dream sprite who is living in town. Wide uh, ears sort of sticking sideways out from his head, glowing at the tips. Definitely sort of gray-green in the fur a little bit uh, around the face, showing that he's gotten a little bit older. He's maybe only about knee-high to you, most. Yeah, this isn't... Uh... I normally don't have a chauffeur in the middle of the dream plane. Where are you taking me? Dream plane? Um, are you all right there? Did you take a knock to the head during the evacuation? Uh, maybe, a, maybe a few, but I don't remember. Well, uh, the wardens are taking us up to the plateau to make sure that we have a safe place to stay. You know, after the hmm. town got attacked, and um, would you I like, like some water? Other creatures there were like crystals and like covered in crystals, and there was a lot of fire and stuff like that, right? Be, Evacuated be, a whole bunch of people, got them out of town as quickly as possible. That type of situation. That's as good of a summary as I could give. Yes. Hmm. I don't know about this. Like, uh, hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. Interesting. And you see just stretching in front and like, behind you a long like, trail of people. Carts, wagons, horses, all that. I like, um, start like touching the hay that might be in the wagon if there's hay in the wagon. Um, Yeah, a little bit. I'd say it's probably what you're using for a pillow. Um, what does the hay feel like? To you, it feels as sharp and tactile as though you were awake. It has got that slight prick of hay when you actually hit the point of it, but it's also fairly soft from the side edges, and uh, there's quite a bit of give to it. You know that whole thing where you that you do where you just like kind of flop backward back into your bed after you're just like uh, I'm awake and it's like 7:40 a.m. Yep, I'm gonna do that. Okay. Uh, from the middle distance, we'll say um, Danica and Alyssa and potentially Barry as well, depending on where you all choose to place yourselves within this caravan. Uh, you would see Rue. Rue's silhouette more than anything. Sit up, look around, have a short conversation, and then flop. Words. 
into the whatever wagon he is currently in. Thanks for driving, by the way. Oh, that's no problem. Um, you got a name, or uh, am I just gonna keep calling you you? You know what? Why not? Call, feel free to call me Rue. Well, it's nice. It's nice to meet you, Rue. What is your name, Mister Wagon Driver? Mister Wagon Driving Person? Oh, my name is Eustace. Or at least that's what I have the mortals call me. You, you know how dream and dream court names can be. It gets a little bit odd over time. Fair. So, Eustace, it is. Nice to meet you, Eustace. Well, it is my pleasure to meet you as well. I pick up a random piece of hay and decide to live out the full cowboy fantasy and just put a piece in my mouth to chew. Lovely. Works out perfectly. Um, Sin, we're going to try something new. This is something I tried two days ago when I was playtesting with another group. I'm going to ask you to call black or red. I will pull a card off the top of the deck. And okay. if you guess correctly, a thing will happen. If you guess okay. incorrectly, a thing will not happen. This is going to come up more and more frequently uh, because I found it a good way for things to change based on what you all want. So when you ask me things, for example, can I look for a secret room? I'll ask you to call black or red. And if you guess correctly, a secret room will exist. And then you'll have to make a skill check to find it. Um, so we're just going to let that be your influence over the trend of the story going forward. So, Sin, black or red? Um, let's have a red. All right. You guessed correctly. As you Ooh. put this Did piece... Did I guess or was it foreseen? Uh, well, considering this was player knowledge, I would hope it's a guess. Otherwise, I need some winning lottery numbers out of you. <laughs> need those anyway. Yeah. But, that said, um, as Rue lays back into this wagon and puts a piece of hay in his mouth, he feels something crinkle in what amounts to, like, a fold of the howdy he's wearing. And it feels like paper. Wait, like I have a piece of paper in my clothing? Yes. Hmm. Do I find the note on my clothing or do I need to investigate all of my clothing to find the note? I'm not going to make you like search through all of your clothing. You, you have a particular like almost a pocket where you tend to slip things like that. What's on the note? It is a simple piece of what seems to be kind of thin and crinkly rice paper. And in a bit of a hasty hand is scrawled the words, enjoy your vacation. With a tiny little heart at the end of the note. I turn the note over. Eustace, do you have, like, some kind of writing utensil? Um, hold on, I might, I might have an old charcoal pencil. And he kind of goes, like, he puts the crop he's using to just keep the horse in line down and rifles through a pocket. And he's like, it's a bit of a nub, but here you go. And he passes you a small little nub of charcoal. I take the nub of charcoal and as best I can, I write, this is not home bad face but with angled eyebrows (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, you definitely write that. Is there anything you'd like to do with the note? I would like to use... I do not know if... Well, I mean, you know, something just for the sake of it, because I assume that these are how, like, the like divine people get messages for things. I take the piece of paper and use my fan to waft it into the air, kind of a safe distance from people. So then I would like to use a lightning bolt to incinerate the paper. <laughs> uh, despite a, you know, somewhat cloudy day, nobody really thinks there's going to be any rain. There is a very uh, tiny pop of lightning and thunder as this piece of paper is struck and the bolt grounds itself out at a distance uh, from the caravan. But it does maybe spook one of the horses a little bit, just at the sudden uh, loud intensity of the bolt. This is not a vacation. Not a vacation. The vacation is supposed to be elsewhere. Yes, this is me yelling this out loud in the middle of this caravan. Uh, you get a few, you get a few um, curious looks from people. Uh, one of the younger children in the group says, "Mom, why is that man yelling?" And then uh, the rest of you definitely hear this shout of this is not a vacation coming from the back of this wagon uh danica we're gonna cut to you what were you doing okay. um, um it's maybe like 11 a.m uh we're gonna kind of montage through these three days of travel of just like what interactions you all would like to have with each other and things you'd like to do okay because danica's an early riser she rises like when the sun does so um i've probably taken to um trying to entertain the kids a lot because Danica wears a lot of um like neutrals very uh mustard colors and she has like this utility belt like a construction worker with all these pockets including her like uh, messenger bag mm -hmm. and she'll be pulling out these little glass discs of various colors and she'll be using her uh thergy to create these like uh images of like flying like pegasi and butterflies and all this and like floating them around the kids and that's, that's what she spends the mornings that's doing. awesome um a lot of the kids are fascinated um a lot of them are asking you questions about your tool belt and things like that and watching the show a lot of the parents were very very thankful <laughs> um just because it keeps them from asking too many questions uh especially about when they're getting to go home and things like that as well the kids have been raised with, you know, almost this idea that the Bane Horde are the boogeyman. You don't really see them all that often. They tend to stick to where the pieces of this continent that used to be much more heavily populated and where they can find more, you know, wilderness and things like that. They don't just go roaming the plains very often. So these kids are sort of living through their own little dark fairy tale right now and a little bit of light and a little bit of magic is definitely appreciated by them for sure yeah it's very um i don't know if anyone's seen the rise of the guardians the sandman yes Where, yeah it. it's like that it's like that that's what she does wonderful wonderful so you are perhaps just ending one of uh one of these small performances and storytelling moments as you hear this is not a vacation <laughs> ring out uh, uh, what would you like to do uh i feel like i feel partially responsible for that um so she's gonna walk she's probably like behind like further back so she's gonna walk to the like by the wagon that Rue's in i just kind of like uh, You're usually gone by now. <laughs> I'm guessing things didn't turn out the way you'd planned? Slow turn toward the camera. Are you responsible for this? 
I'm responsible for a lot of things. This is not one of them that I know of. No. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm kind of the I'm kind of torn here. I this this could be a nightmare for all I know. Right? I like I this this could all just be like really bad dream and I have received a paper where they have explained that I ha I cannot continue the journey that I'm on and therefore I cannot go home. So I'm gonna ask you a favor. You do weird magic y things, right? Like you can do all of that stuff, and yeah. one of them involves fire, right? Uh-huh. Where are you going with this? I'm just gonna like grab like a small tuft of my hair. Set this on fire real quick. That's gonna smell awful. I kind of really don't want to do that. Excuse me, I take very good care of my hair. Now I'm going to need you to set that on fire. Not the whole thing, just like a small piece. gonna kind of just reach forward with the tips of my fingers and just okay hold on it it continues burning okay um I imagine this isn't a very large fire on top of my head, so a bit of wind should help here. Uh, you are um, feeling that heat, and it is going to start burning you if you are not uh, putting it out with a quickness. Can I use aromancy to put out the fire? Yes. Um, it may steal Eustace's floppy hat that he's wearing, um, as it will be a significant uh, bit of wind required, but you can put yourself out like uh, Hades getting blown out in the Disney film. That's basically the plan here. So, after I put this out, I'm like, hmm. Your hair is also now ruined, by the way. Mildly. That's what styling is for, and besides, most of the time it's method. I, um, hmm. Well, it hasn't automatically grown back, so I guess I'm still in the real world. You could have just asked, you know. I don't, to be, you know, like, no disrespect to you, but considering that I found a note that materialized out of nowhere in the middle of my jacket, I figured if I didn't believe this note, I was going to need more extreme measures. Pause for just a moment. Barry. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, that's what I was trying to find the button and not press the wrong one. Again. <laughs> Barry, you catch Eustace's Hello. hat as it is sort of fluttering away down the caravan. And I just walked out of the forest too, so bright time. Wonderful. There's basically not really a full forest, but like a small copse of trees on along the road as you were moving along. And uh, you've stepped out of it. You've caught this hat out of nowhere. You see what looks to be um, Rue's flaming hair suddenly get put out at a distance. And um, Eustace mourning what he thought was going to be losing his favorite hat. What do I, you do? Um, I unladed myself of an armful of apricots. Um, I, I pulled them all into Eustace's hat. And um, I just drove one of the kids that Danica was previously entertaining. Uh, um, yeah. Well, what do you need? Take a few of these for your for yourself and your friends. 
oh, um, okay, thank you. And like takes three and just passes them out to their friends and they all skitter off. And then I um stroll over towards uh Danica and Rue and Eustace. Um I pour the apricots in Rue's lap. <laughs> what are these for? Good morning. I'll take one. Oh. Well in that case. Um, thank you for the, what are these? Apricots? Thank you for the apricots. Yes. Eustace, here is your hat. Eustace just looks over and he says, oh, well, thank you. Um, I, I very you much appreciate that. Like an, would you like an apricot, Eustace? I feel like it's the least I could do. Aside oh. from returning your hat. I like them, but they don't like me. If I don't want to wind up a little sick in the stomach for the rest of the day, I'd best avoid them. Thank you very much. Here's a bushel right. of mint, Eustace. Oh, you are lovely, Barry. Thank you very much. And he just takes a little bushel and starts chewing on it. So, so um, strange things have happened today. Um, those strange things include me still existing Rude. well okay me still existing here i don't mean to interrupt but rue as you say strange things have happened today there is a small squawk and a quail lands at your feet with an arrow in it Alyssa. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have been mostly hunting to help feed this caravan they have quite a bit of food but you know you've been you know catching a few quail and things like that as you can and a couple of rabbits here and there and you took a shot from one of the other moving wagons and it just happened to land in this one so okay. what would you like to do i suppose i'll just hop off and walk over and just pick up the quail and just like I as i'm it picking too. it up like remove it from the arrow Quail kebab? Is that what we were going for today? I still have yet to clean it. It's going to be for tonight's dinner. Just this one? This is the one that I most recently caught, yeah. Huh. Oh. More curious by the moment. Alyssa's is just going to tip a nod over to Barry. And then just like... Would you like an apricot? No, thank you. Um, but thank you all the same. I have some meat if you would like it. Instead. And he holds out a mint leaf. No, thank you. Let me guess, you're leaf. not... <laughs> you're not hungry. <laughs> Passes over a mint leaf. No, I'm fasting. The natural sucrose. We must have it. <laughs> one, one of the little kids runs over and just kind of bumps into Alyssa and just says, Oh, sorry. And dodges around and keeps going. Right. Well... Um, Danica, you were saying, you were asking me some questions, and you seem to know a lot about, well, me still being here, um, as opposed to anywhere else. Is there anything you would like to share? I mean, considering we've met before, and you kind of disappeared the next day after showing up in my dreams, I kind of considered that was a consistent thing. Ah, uh, you'd be correct about that. Well, except for today. Except for today. Um, also, you know, for what it's worth, Danica, 
Thank you for setting my hair on fire. It might take a little while to repair this, or I might have to get creative with styling, but it at least kept me from running into the woods and finding the most fearsome creature I could find to see if it would just maul me to death and I would respawn. Are you You're okay, welcome? young man? You sound a little bit disturbed. Do, do you need a doctor? Even for a dreamwalker such as yourself, that is very extreme. It is, but I don't know how to make sense of things otherwise. And also, I do not know if I need a doctor, but I might take you up on that offer for mint. Well, there's more than enough to go around. Feel free. At, the, at this point, Alyssa has already just like faded back into the caravan shadows. Well, I suppose, you know, if for no other reason than the fact that I am by destiny to at this point. We will see you later, Arrow Girl, wherever you happen to go. <laughs> that just, that, I'm sorry, that got me. <laughs> An apt description. I appreciate it. That is her nickname forever. <laughs> Arrow Girl. Arrow Girl. <laughs> Ah, going to have I... a superhero show on Netflix. <laughs> call, call her Maskness Evergreen. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> she doesn't deserve to parody that unfortunate happenstance of a trilogy. True, true. What's wrong, what's wrong with Battle Royale? I thought everybody enjoyed that movie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with... Oh my god, I can't believe I almost hit that. Uh, Y'all are I mean, a whole damn mess. <laughs> right. I mean, at this well, point, I would like to note that Barry would know Alyssa the most out of all out of all three of you. Yes, I would assume. Just because of the frequent, uh, frequent missions they've been on together yeah. since her joining. I would assume um, you two are sort of the longest running members of the Gleam Wardens currently um, out of the party. Danica might be a little bit newer. Um, and Rue uh, exists here now. Uh, um, so we're going to speed this along a little bit. Uh, what would you all like to do whilst part of this caravan you have three days of travel ahead of you and i'm gonna kind of break it up and just say we're gonna interact a bit we might have a dream instance we'll interact a bit and then you all will arrive at what is partially the destination you're heading to uh, well i suppose if i'm going to be here i might as well make myself comfortable so i'm going to spend the next day or two depending on how long it takes for the amount of people you have here, getting to know um, all of the, as far as I'm able to determine, major figures, their occupations, stores that people run, things that people trade in and all of that. So I know where to find things if I need them later. Okay. Well, for the most part, um, these people are effectively, you know, refugees. So they won't necessarily have shops yet but they do have plans for setting them up wherever they wind up um you would meet uh zero dark fang who is running the gleam warden expeditionary force she is uh, basically a high-ranking member of the scout corps um she's a very very effective ranger she's got um darker hair kind of pulled back and two cat-like eyes but other than that seems fairly humanoid um and she's about your height uh, you can see she carries a pair of daggers strapped on her belt and uh, a crossbow slung over her back. And she chats with you a little bit. She's kind of busy making sure everyone's still moving and kind of seems distracted and a little bit worried overall. Uh, she's pretty frequently ranging beyond the caravan too to make sure the horde isn't following behind. Um, so you catch her a few times, you catch the former mayor of the town, we'll call him uh, Quinn. And Quinn is this somewhat interesting looking bird folk. He looks a little bit like a sparrow, um, 
version of what would be like a D&D Aarakocra, except um, he's fairly short. He's perhaps a head shorter than you, and his, his coloration is a bit more red than brown as a sparrow would be. And he wears this kind of nice little sash and uh, almost what looks like a kilt. And he seems fairly young to be a town mayor and has a lot of plans for setting things up and establishing buildings and so on. He seems to have a bit of an architectural mind about him. Um, so Quinn just looks you over and he says, uh, Yeah, hi. Um, if you're looking for people to get to know, um, well, there's me, and I'm sort of the liaison to the Gleam Wardens now, I guess. We're gonna have to figure out where to put everybody, and, uh... Well, other than that, we had a few sh shops. Um, depends on what you're looking for, really. We had a we had a seamstress in town who could make clothing. Um, her name is, uh, Bella. She's down at the front there. Um, other than that, what are you looking for? At this point, information, I assume. I'm, I don't know how long I'll be here. I just want to know where things are while I'm here. And maybe, I suppose, ways that I can be useful. Might as well try to be. It will give me something to do. Well, if you're looking for ways to be useful, right now we're... Um... Our biggest trouble is just making sure we have enough food to make the trip. So if you if you have any way to help with that, it would certainly be appreciated. But other than that, um, you know, generally trying to raise people's spirits. Uh, it's been it's been quite a few years since any of us dealt with a horde attack, so people are a little a little down and out about it. Um, maybe the Gleam Wardens might need some help too. They seem a little. Uh, wigged out about something or other. Barry, Danica, and Alyssa, you would all know, um, everybody's been on a little bit of high alert. Not just because of the Bane Horde, but because of the implication that the Beacon was sabotaged. Oh, okay, well, what is everybody down and out about? Well, you know, a lot of us, especially a lot of the younger ones, um, towards bedtime stories at this point. They don't come this far east. Losing homes, losing places, that's that's a little bit rough. These folks aren't accustomed to having to travel and leave their things behind. You know, a lot of us been around Twin Creeks for a couple generations at this point, despite how small it is. So, moving, mo moving shop, while a necessity everybody's accepted, ain't exactly a, a welcome change by all. Unfortunately. At this point, as he's listening, like, on the one hand, I'm making an effort to empathize. On the other hand, it's hard to understand the levels of, um, like the levels of sadness that people feel from having to like up and change just situations at a moment's notice, considering that I have had to. So there's a thing of being like, well, maybe I'm best served talking to the gleam, um, gleam wardens and maybe figuring out um, how I can help them then. Well, if, if that's what you feel like, um, more than, is, more than welcome. Is there, anything else, is there anything else you want to mention? Um, no, we haven't really had any issues in the traveling yet. Um, we may just need As some he help. Says that, are my spider senses tingling for any of this? Uh, what, what would you, um, potentially expect to set off your spider senses? Well, you know, like, nothing has happened yet, and I'm just like, hmm, well, wait, what do you mean yet? And just having that whole moment of, um, is this a, is this a moment of Mancy 
for the uh, for the Claros. Fair enough. Uh, black or red? Red. I pulled black. So, in this instance, you kind of... You do get a little bit of a flash of claromancy, and you expect something, you know, maybe dangerous to happen, maybe uh, something scary or one of the creatures to pop back up, but no, it's just your spider sense is telling you to get out of the way of a horse. So... I think I think I have an idea for at least I have a better idea of how I can help the caravan and I'm going to take that and go and try to find the gleam wardens. Yeah, um it it'd be pretty easy. Uh I feel like at this point Zira is probably speaking to Alyssa because Alyssa was the one who discovered that the beacon had been sabotaged and they're probably conferring with each other perhaps a bit farther away from the group. Um should Danica or Barry choose, they can be uh, in on the conversation just because Zira pretty much knows that they were away from the beacon and couldn't have been the ones to sabotage it at that point, um, especially since y'all were the frontliners for the fight. So Zira's sort of ruled you out currently for the investigation. I would like to be present for this conversation. I think I would too. Okay. So Zira's just sort of walking along and kind of keeping her head on a swivel. And she says, um, well, I've been going around trying to see if maybe anyone has stuff in their things. I hate searching through people's stuff when they don't know I'm doing it, but I still have yet to find the crystal. So, so far, it's none of the townsfolk that I've checked. I do still worry about the patrolman, the beacon, however. When did they last leave out? The last patrol was the evening before, and they are still helping patrol the caravan, so I can't exactly pull them away from that, unfortunately. And at this point, I'm a bit worried about people's morale, so I'm trying not to um, make any broad accusations at the moment. I mean, nobody noticed... Uh, the beacon failing, other than maybe more of us wise ones, but so far they're all shaken by the horde. Yes. Um, pause for GM things. Does anyone have the names of the two people who are patrolling that I gave you? I do. I, I sure as hell don't have them. I do. Give me I five named those seconds off the cuff. to page through my notes. Continue talking. You know, at exactly 1.25 p.m. in the afternoon that day, I did sense that the magic of the beacon had disappeared. And Zero just, like, raises an eyebrow and she says, Oddly specific, Very. but I suppose I shouldn't be surprised at the capabilities of a more magically ingrained inclined creatures such as yourself? Yes, I was out in the orchards helping a farmer with their trees and I sensed the magic just disappear. Oh. Mm. That's... What I can't understand is why anyone would even want to take it. All they've done is uproot their entire town. There's no purpose behind it. Unless they're just looking to cause some chaos, but... It's not like Twin Creeks was a very important area. It supplied the plateau with a bit of food and a bit of grain. But other than that... What troubles me the most now... Is that we're leading this person straight to the plateau. A question... Yes, there is a find... physical barrier. Hmm? Oh, please. A question, if I may. How long ago was this? Uh, it would have been... This is the yes, day okay. after the attack. No, I mean, what day are they, you know, conjecturing that this whole thing would have gone missing? The attack. Like, um, when we left. Yeah. The day off. It, 
it was the day of the attack and then the Bane Horde showed up almost immediately after the beacon was gone. Uh, good to know. Um, carry on. And I immediately leave the room and just go try to find a quiet spot in a haystack. I mean, yeah, um, you, you, you certainly can. Um, most of the haystacks are mobile in the back of wagons, so you can just kind of go back to Eustace if you would like and say... Hey. I just kind of like... I pick, one, I pick one and flop into it, and after this um, section where people are speaking, I would like to make a claromancy check. All right. Alyssa? I uh, somehow managed to miss the names. I know one of them started with an A. Um, well, they're going to be called... Uh, we'll call them Arlen and Fane for the two patrolmen. And I, I see that look. <laughs> the, the moment one of your players gets the reference. I haven't I haven't had the time to really uh, talk to Armin and Fane myself. Unfortunately, the spirits the spirits back of that twin group weren't uh, weren't many. And none of them really concerned or concerned themselves with the beacon. Was there a particular Esper Baron? Holding charge over the town? No, not this far out. They tend to try and stick close to their sources. I do know the, partic the particular crystal here was sourced from... Me scrambling to NPC sheet. Um, excuse me for just a moment while I find my... <laughs> no, it wouldn't be them. They're, they're a little bit too far out. I need to go... Uh, Find my uh, actions. I mean, also correct trans transcriptions. Yeah, it, like you're not wrong. Hold on. Needed to remember where it was. So it would have been. Um, More than likely, it would have been the Silk Hand family. They are a family of Esper parents who also specialize in uh, harvesting spider silk from the inverted forest where um, Barry Your Grove is located on sort of the north side of the um, of the plateau. Now. That means that they are a bit farther away, much like the Noteworthies, but they tend to range a bit farther in their trade as well because of their silk trade. <laughs> this crystal would have been sourced from them. But yes, other than knowing it's from them, uh, Varens don't really reach this far out. Not usually, unless there's chances of another mine opening up. So they are a bit, uh... Not this far east. The last one was a few miles off. Yes. That said, uh, I'm worried. I'm worried maybe perhaps one of the barons got to either Arlen or Fane. I don't know what purpose they would have for it, perhaps just to retrieve the crystal. But taking the crystal instead of just destroying the lantern is a bit of a particular way to do it, in my opinion. So, at Are Arlen and Fane particularly versed in the creation and thus deconstruction of lanterns? Arlen is a farm boy, so no. Uh, Fane... Fane has a little bit of magic about him, but from what I know, it's more, um... It's more... Earth-based. A bit like Barry. He's, um... He's good at moving stone and things like that. For a while there, he was, uh, working with the engineering corps as a... As an engineer and, um more of a mason, really. 
and then he transferred over to the expeditionary forces. So. I'll give a think on it. About potential Baron connections. And with that, Alyssa just, like, sort of steps side steps away from the group and, like, just, again, just using that Nyxergy and just fading off into the shadows to the back end of the um, caravan, probably trying to intercept Arlen or Fane. Okay. Danica, any thoughts? Zero's just sort of musing out loud about what might be going on. Yeah, Danica's kind of just like, but she's not like in the conversation. She's kind of sidestepped, just listening in, kind of got a notebook and keeping notes and in a really small journal of hers and mostly just um, thinking, trying to, because she was far away from the lantern the entire time and kind of keeping an eye on where people are, just mm -hmm. observing mostly. Danica, you tend to have your eyes on a crowd. If you... If you see someone acting out of turn, take note and let me know as quietly as you can, if you please. Um, certainly, of course. Much appreciated. And Barry, you said you could sense when the beacon crystal was removed. Yes. Yeah. Does that mean or you can... Or rather, I could feel the lack of its presence. If you were to put some time into focus, do you think you'd potentially be able to find the crystal to see through figuring out if that feeling comes back or not? I think with some... Uh... How do you say it? With some mouth and a little bit of elbow grease, I might find a way to locate it. All right. If you need any resources, um, check in with the other Chris techs and just try not to let them know what you're working on, if you please. Of course. And Zero will just sort of look around and say, I'm going to head to the back of the caravan and head off for a few miles just to... Try and make it seem like I'm not looking too hard at anyone in the caravan, if you don't mind. Good day to you. Very well. And she sort of pulls Alyssa's trick, but doesn't completely disappear and just starts weaving through the crowd. Rue. It's time for that claromancy check. Now, I'm going to ask you, what is it um, you sort of as a player are... What kind of information are you looking for out of this check? So, I know where the tower is, or was, would have been in the town mm -hmm. of Tidbury in my, in my time being there, because I, from what I understand, these beacons are real hard to miss. Mm hmm Yep, yeah, it's basically like, um, it'd be roughly the size of like a grandfather clock of a pedestal with this iron and brass lantern on top of it. Okay, so... I'm going to try to concentrate on that area of the town in this claromancy. And what I'm looking for is, do I see, like, is there something unusual about people going into, coming out of the tower in that area at that time? Hmm. All right. I'll say this is you kind of like, jumping into the past a little bit through your abilities. This is fun. Um, I'll set this at a two. This is not super difficult. You're not pressed for time or anything like that. Okay. Um, so we are going to draw a card and we are going to draw another card. Um, I drew an ace and an ace of hearts and a five clubs. An ace of hearts and a five of clubs. Okay. So, um, Mark one portion of your omen for the ace, and okay. I I played a ten and a four. So um, I'm going to give you yes. 
Uh, I'm going to give you two very vague choices, and you get to choose what you get between the two of them. Neither of which will be very good. Oh, oh, the joy. Uh, give me a second to think here. So. Wait a minute. How much potential do I have? Uh, you should. We start each session with four. Um, if you have more than four uh, starting a session, it carries over. So if you have less than oh. four, you go up to it. Okay. So I have, uh, I guess, question here. Mm -hmm. And um, can I spend a potential to re-roll? I guess, I guess re-roll one of these two cards. Sure. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, okay. Now I have an eight, um, an eight of hearts. An eight of hearts. And what was the other card? Um, a five of clubs. Eight and a five. So you're still, uh, one lower than me, but you did, uh, remove the negative effect of that ace, we'll say. So, in that instance, um, I'll still give you a choice, but it won't be bad. Uh, you'll get your choice of information here. Do you want to see how it was taken, but not see who it was taken by? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to see how the Bane Horde was ready at a moment's notice? Between these two bits of information, I think the one that I would want is to see how it was taken. Well, actually, wait. I think I'm going to choose to see how the Bane Horde was prepared the moment it was gone. We're going to go with option two. Interesting. Okay. So. Um, because... Well, I have a few I have a few reasons why, but I think it would be um, I think if there is someone or something that's organizing the bane like like making the effort to organize the bane horde, that might be the like my reasoning is that might be the larger threat to deal with. Very true, very true. Um, also, I would like to add a small ritual to this whole thing in case anybody happens to see me doing so. Go for it. Um, it's kind of like a like a cross leg meditative pose, but what you see is like my like jacket that I wear, like the howry that I wear, is like floating in a gentle breeze. But it has no correlation to the direction that I'm moving or to the actual environment that we're in. Okay. Uh, question. Your... Your Howry has chamomile petals on it, yes? Chamomile flowers? It does. It does. I'd like to add one little extra detail, and it's that those chamomile petals and flowers move as though they were alive and experiencing a breeze on the on the code itself here for it it's extra now you jump back into the past with your claromantic abilities and you focus on the beacon and instead you sort of have your what would be your mind's eye pulled away from town you don't get to see the crystal being taken because uh, something about your ability says Effectively, you're asking the wrong question here. This isn't the most important thing. And uh -huh. so it pulls you. And you're pulled beyond town. You're pulled out in sort of south-southwest to this sort of older dirt road. You don't know where it leads. 
I don't necessarily know where it comes from either, but it looks like it was once a well-traveled trade road. Off in the distance, you see two large statues standing side by side. One of which, its head, the head of a former, you know, looks like might be a diplomat or a mage by the robes they're wearing, is on the ground at its feet. You don't really get a sense for how large they are, but you know they're big. And for a moment, you are left in front of these statues. And you see between them a sort of silhouetted group of creatures, we'll say. Some of them you do recognize as the crowd that was coming not, you know, immediately when the attack happened, but the ones that were farther away who entered the town after the evacuation was over. Um, you just sort of recognize the silhouettes uh, at this uh -huh. distance. And you see that between these two statues, there are sort of these nodes of crystal. One is on the ground and one is on each side, uh, sort of the edges of the statues themselves pointing inwards towards each other. And one of these beings waves a hand and... The space between these three nodes almost seems to lens itself. Um, the light warps and you see this. It looks almost like the accretion disk of a black hole appear. Uh -huh. And it appears amidst this crowd for a split second and then it shrinks back down on itself and they're gone. And then you watch all three nodes break and crumble. As though the crystal died off doing this. The figure walks away. And then you rush back to effectively the edge of town. And you see into the warehouse that was burned. Where they would normally store harvested rice from the rice paddies. And you see one, of, uh, one figure inside who you assume was formerly someone that lived in this town. A half-fire giant with sort of glowing veins beneath their skin. Um, a bright flame of hair looking kind of like Hades from Disney. Um, and he is looking around in the darkness of this um, warehouse. And from a pocket, he pulls out a shard of this crystal. But it is... Unlike the crystal you saw on the creatures, it is very dull. It is almost more like a slate gray than the deep, deep, like, vanta black it was on the living creatures. Uh -huh. He waits a moment. And then you, you can see the crystal goes from that gray and fades to the dark black again. And then it starts to spread over his right arm. And it forms the blade. And then your vision cuts and you are back to yourself. A question in all of that adventuring. There's a figure there. Is it a silhouetted figure that I'm unable to make out any distinguishing features for? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Red or black? Black. You do catch a few features. You catch Yay. what would be a very well-made cloak. Um, nothing that is really available at this point in time. You expect it is sort of uh, pre-hoard made and would therefore be a bit of an heirloom at this point. Um, you know, it's a 200-year-old cloak that's in very, very good condition, potentially magical. You don't see facial features, but you do see um, they don't have any sleeves. They appear to be wearing the cloak more to keep the sun off their back than anything. And um, curling up one arm is sort of this twisting helix of black ink, perhaps, up their right arm to about their elbow. It looks to maybe start at their palm, but you're unsure. So, some strange 
but he like made some strange portal to bring everything through. Yeah. Um, kind of when I come to myself, I take a small stretch and just casually go to find the rest of the party. Okay. And you would know too, like when I say that those three crystal nodes broke, like they disintegrated, there was nothing left of them. So whatever magic was used there, it was... It was consumed in the casting as it were. Yes, effectively. So. I'll say, um, this is where you all kind of take it from here. Interact and do as you see fit. Um, after this, we'll probably cut to maybe skip a day and we'll get to you all sort of arriving at the edge of the plateau. So, what would you all like to do? Danica's probably going back and forth between, um, I want one entertaining the kids because obviously, and then, um, to help observe, kind of going around and checking like the wagons for any damages because you know it's part of their skill set is metalwork. So, as a way of infiltrating, obviously, people because that's the closest thing to sneaky she can do. <laughs> Danica, the closest thing to sneaky she can be is helpful. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. We love it. Um, yeah, you're definitely helping people out and you get a couple of whispers of things that are kind of going on. Um, you know, people just like, oh, I, I heard the beacon failed or I heard that, um, the gleam wardens drew them and so on and so forth. And the townsfolk very clearly have questions, but just aren't asking them at this point. Mm -hmm. They kind of have different priorities. You do manage to fix a few wagons along the way, for sure. And you manage to stick close to Arlen and Fane, but they're sort of just shooting the shit. They're like, they're talking, you know, hey, what are you going to do when we get back to Crestfall? You want to go get drinks? Blah, blah, blah. Like, they seem friendly. At least to each other. Interesting. Where do I find Alyssa? And Barry? That would be up to them. I mean, at this uh, point, Alyssa would probably be next to the sick cart or helping, you know, the elderly who were walking but can't for the rest of the day up into said carts. So. As for Barry, he's currently looking for a fig tree. <laughs> a fig tree? That is highly specific. Okay. Um, black or red? We'll see if you find this fig tree. Black. You find a fig tree. <laughs> Victory. Victory. Uh, so... When Barry finds this fig tree, he um, he chooses a limb, um, rather a branch from this fig tree that is that seems large and thick enough to serve as a cane or walking stick. Absolutely, you definitely managed to do so. And then, um, almost as though he were like. Uh, a potter squeezing um squeezing a portion of clay from their um from their uh what do you call it um from their base amount he the slab? squeezes down yes uh from the slab um he squeezes down on the base of this branch and it sort of um breaks off like clay and in its place is uh what do you call it um the the green growth of of uh, what will be a replacement branch nice. Sprout. Sprout. um and then he disappears from that uh from that location 
and appears closest to the Chris Tech uh, Quartermaster. Okay. Uh, we'll say this Quartermaster um, is... How do I want to describe them? They are about uh, six feet tall, about seven and a half if you include the horn, because they are this large sort of um, beetle folk based on a Hercules beetle, and the horn sort of curves upwards and adds about an extra foot and a half to them. And they, um, their wings are kind of flicking in and out a little bit. Their shell is intricately painted. And they have, it's almost the, what would be the equivalent of tattoos for people who didn't have a shell. And um, it's actually depicting sort of the rolling hills of the plateau in many instances. And uh, we will call them uh, Marrow. And Marrow is uh, just sort of looking over some of the supplies of the uh, of the caravan, and also appears to have taken the uh, the actual lantern casing, which is now empty, from mm -hmm. um, Twin Creeks. And Marrow uh, sees you. Rue, we'll get to you and Alyssa in a moment. Uh, Marrow sees you and kind of waves you down and says, "Well, hey there, Barry." Uh, Are you are you looking for anything? Do you need supplies? Looking to do some uh, work on yes. the road? I am I would like to requisition two slivers of physical aether and that iron casing. Oh, uh, all right. I was just looking over some of the rune work on it, make sure it was still functional so we could maybe put it back to use back home, but sure. Um whatever you do, just Make sure it's still nice and uh, two pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And they come up with uh, perhaps two sort of semi-crystalline shards. Uh, they look much smaller than would be in a beacon, um, mm -hmm. but it is of the same material of the uh, boreal crest. Just more, um, maybe about yay big, yay long, and um, very thin. And they say, this is about all I got on me because we are... I'm sort of running low for a bit there, so here you are. Um, and if you have it, a spool of silver or copper wire. Ooh. Uh, you know what? Give me just a second. And Marrow actually like hops off the wagon and goes to their own bags and says, uh, Hold on, and they're rifling through and rifling through, and you hear like the tinking of different um, metal tools as they're going through, perhaps small wrenches, perhaps small scribing tools. And they bring out amongst sort of their three clawed hand. Aha! Uh -huh. um, it's running a little short, but it's about all the copper I got left. Thank you very much. So, uh, good luck with whatever you're working on. Um, if I can, if you don't destroy it or break it, I would like to get that casing back from you eventually, but uh, I wouldn't worry about it until we're back to the plateau. All right, now let's get back to figuring out how to make a mobile cook pot. And like you see, he goes back to, or they go back to, pardon me, um, tinkering with what looks to be a rig they could attach to a moving wagon. That would hold a flame and a pot over it. Just would so that like they can keep advice? moving. Uh, nah, I think I got this. It's more just working with limited supplies. Um, the structure isn't the problem. It's, it's anchoring it. That's the issue. Currently. But you got your uh, own work to do. I, I got my own little uh, small army of engineers who are bored and looking to work on things other than wagons right now, so we'll do just fine. Wonderful. And Barry um, sort of disappears into another bush um, and reappears next to Eustace's cart where he just rolls into it to work on his project. Is Barry just Nigel Thornberry but with an engineering degree? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Smashing. I, I've been waiting for the smashing to come out. Um, but that said, uh, <laughs> Rue, you certainly run into uh, Alyssa and Barry at this point. What? Yeah. What you doing? At this point, this is probably just like perched on the edge of a cart, cleaning the rest of the birds she caught. There are at least two more quail and a rabbit. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Clean on the kills? Why? Have you found anything about, you know, the thing you were looking for? Not yet. Island of Bane are... adults. Well, how are y'all investigating that? Alyssa just, like, gives a flat look. As if she could give a flat look from the entire mask, her entire mask, like... Like, face. if you had animated eyebrows, they would just be like this? Yeah. <laughs> and just... A slight little... Uh, they slight don't little really... Incline. A slight little incline, yes. They don't really, uh... Nobody really talks <laughs> to me, which is fine. But no, I haven't gotten around to it. Figured I'd get the kills clean and get a get what families that need the more meat figured out before. Excuse you. Do anything else. I talk to you all the time. None of the rest of you hear that. Alyssa is going to very pointedly ignore the voice. Oh, you don't have to tell me. I know when the vocal effects come on what that means. That means supernatural shenanigans are happening. <laughs> Mayhaps. 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 Most likely. But Alyssa just like shifts a little and just like adjusts back part part of her robe and just as I said. Marlon and Fane don't talk to me, and it's really hard not to seem... And, like, you watch her mouth just pull this weird straight line. Mm. Fuck. But it's fine. I'll figure it out somehow. If the... Well. If, if the beacon is with the caravan... Hidden or not, if we come upon any spirits, they'll be able to pick up, pick it up slightly. Well, if you were so interested, I might have some information that might be helpful, but in a slightly different manner. Any information we can have will be better than nothing. Oh, I'm aware. I'm also aware that this might not be the safest venue by which to give it. Of course. Um, that, that is fair. If you need to rearrange for a certain meeting time, I can... I don't eat much at night anyways. Well, here... Why don't I make a suggestion? After the events of the evening are over and you've had a bit of time to rest, we can talk about it. Of course. That well, sounds I don't mean to more keep amenable. You. Well, you know, I don't mean to keep you or anything. However, um, if I can be of help then in some way, then do let me know. Otherwise, I'll see if I can go about and maybe bother other people. Hmm. I go and I find a random gleam, gleam warden. 
Okay. And you find uh, probably a guardian, one of the uh, bulkier sort of fighter types of the group. And uh, she is probably, we'll say, you know, about five feet tall, fairly compact, but broader shouldered. Definitely uh, looks like she could pick you up over her head and throw you half a mile. Um, has basically two small, like, war hammers strapped to her belt. Uh, they look like they're repurposed blacksmithing hammers, uh, for sure. And she's got her hair tied back. She's um, uh, Tempest Orcish in nature, so she's uh, got some storm blood in her. Got the lower uh, orc fangs, um, lightning pattern. Um, it, it, it'd be their equivalent of freckles, but they're lightning bolts down the arms um, and a little bit across her face as well. And uh-huh. she just says, Yeah, what can I do for you? Well, I understand that things have been very difficult as of late. For a lot of reasons. So I that's a fucking I'd way to I put could, it. Yeah. I'd see, thought I'd see what I could do to maybe help with morale a bit. What entertains the troops here? <laughs> uh, well, depends on who you're talking about. Now, Jackson, Ferris, and his group of the Gleam Wardens, they're all, um, they all like some... Jackson. Jackson was the, was the original patrol. It was Jackson Ferris. Oh, well. Arlen and Faye no longer exist. It's Jackson and Ferris. Um, no, they can they be all like four. They still exist. No, they, they still exist. They Please, still exist. Arlen and Faye exist. They still exist. Um, they are a pair of twins. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> It would be great. Quadruplets now. No, no, no. It is two pairs of twins. Or two sets of twins, I should say. Fane and Ferris and Arlen and Jackson are twins of each other. Um, and they are, of course, uh, identical twins. That's great. Right. <laughs> two twins of twins. Uh, now, that said... Um, yeah, so Jackson and Ferris kind of go for the more music and drinking side of things. Me and the other Guardians, um, we we tend to enjoy betting on a good fight, and uh, or just a good arm wrestling competition, really. A lot of us do enjoy food. Food usually helps. If you could find a way to cook some good food. Traveling sucks. You know, not a lot of us got some of the good uh, stall food back in the market at Twin Creeks before things went to shit, so you know how that goes. But uh, other than that, um, good old competition never hurts, too. You know, get a couple archery competitions going along the way, see who can hit a moving target the best. Nothing nothing too fancy. Uh, if you got some dice or a deck of cards, I'm sure you can win, uh, you know, bushel apples or something along the way. Uh, also, just so you all know, um, I forgot to mention beforehand, I have inputted two new channel commands so that uh, our good viewers at home can buy you points of potential. And we have just had one of those redeemed. So that's sort of a communal pool, if you'd say you'd I, like. Um, I also redeemed a narrator potential before that. And that will be for me for later if I want to make things hurt. Um, Spoiler alert. He does. No. Why would <laughs> I do such does. a thing? No. Um, let me just write down that I have that point. You impugn my character, sir. You impugn my character. Um, <laughs> THC says Crow would never do anything just for the content. No, <laughs> me? Never. Um... <laughs> Uh, that said, yeah, um, and then she looks, she says, and she says, oh, and, uh, I'm Jessica, by the way. Nice to meet you, Jessica. I'm Rue. Nice to meet you, too. You're the, I gotta say, you got some of the most colorful clothes I've seen in a while. You steal those off the back of an Esper Baron? 
Because if he did, I ain't gonna say shit about it. I didn't, but you know, we can pretend that I did. I like the sound of that. You get the sense Jessica's a little bit of a shit disturber. Um, likes a little bit of mischief? Yeah, yeah a little bit. A little bit chaos gremlin. So, absolutely. Jessica, you know, I could be wrong here, but you seem to strike me as one who enjoys the occasional shenanigan. I mean, if shenanigans are offered, I would never say I start them. But I am a good follow through. Here, why don't I just lend you something for the briefest of moments? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> For those watching at home, um, Rue has been crafted in such a way that their aromancy skill comes from their fan that they carry. So, do it, do it, Rue, do it. <laughs> you hand Jessica your fan, and she kind of looks over and she says. And what exactly am I supposed to do with this other than seem like an Esper Baron's wife that's clutching her pearls? Well, well, Jessica, I did not know that you were into um, the performing arts. But if you happen not to be, um, it is also useful in causing some shenanigans. Well, at least, you know, for those who happen to know how to use it. And she just kind of like gives you a curious look and like opens it up tentatively and gets a little like gust of the wind magic off it. And she's like, oh. <laughs> I see. And then she immediately starts scoping a target. <laughs> like you could just, her so, head doesn't turn, but you can see her eyes start scanning the crowd. I feel like Alyssa so would be a very I good would, target. So this is one of those feathers in her lap. This is one of those moments where I'm going to say that this whole thing matters. So I'm going to give this to her knowing that she does not know the name of this fan. Which means she only gets half of the power that it normally gets. Mm -hmm. But it's still enough to be a troublemaker if she really wants to. Oh, uh, for sure. Know, for the briefest of moments. And as was put forth, um, Alyssa is off on a wagon cleaning the last of the quail. And uh, has many of the feathers, which Alyssa was planning to save for fletching for feathers. In sort of a small... Um, almost like a bowl uh, in her lap. And, you know, Jessica does that thing where, like, her back's a little straight, and without turning her head, she looks over and just goes and flicks her wrist with the fan. And Alyssa, all of a sudden, there's this gust of wind, and the feathers go into your face. <laughs> there are a few that get spat out your mouth, but for anyone watching, the feathers hook into the mask around its edges, and it looks very much like you are a half-plucked oh masked chicken for a quick second. With just, like, random feathers poking out every which way from around the edge of the mask and the veil that you wear. Yeah, and they're also caught in the rest of the veil, too, so it's just, like... Yeah, you look like a half-plucked masked chicken. And Jessica very quickly closes the fan and hands it back to you, Rue, and just, like, turns her back and starts covering a chuckle to sort of try and not give away that her shoulders are shaking from laughing too hard. I put the fan away and say, Oh, I see. Well, you know, if you ever do get bored, feel free to find me again at some point.
And she just says, yeah, I'll definitely ruin that one. And she's like, damn, you got a tear in her eye. You get the sense that maybe Jessica's one of those people that feels like Alyssa's way too uptight and is constantly trying to bug the crap out of her to get her to crack a little bit. Actually, let me ask you about that one over there. Hmm? What, what do you know about Alyssa? <laughs> I mean, I'm getting the feathers from here are obvious. Oh, yeah, from there. And like, there's some raucous laughter going on. So nobody's going to overhear this conversation at this point. Um, Alyssa, remind me, how long have you been with the wardens? I mean, how long back has been the attack on our hometown? Do we want to make this a matter of months or a matter of years? Uh, at this point, probably we're getting close to the one year anniversary of the attack. Okay. Uh, so Jessica would look at you and say, uh, we don't really know all that much about her. She joined up just after the people from uh, Blackwater came through. You know, almost a year ago was the last time we took in refugees from an attack. The puns in Twitch chat right now are too much. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Jessica just says, yeah, she, she joined up shortly after that. Um, a lot of us figure she might have come in with them, but, you know, other than her name, we don't really have much to go on. She's been a good shot. She's been a great member of, uh, which core do you think she'd be a part of? Scout or Guardian or... Um... She probably flops a lot between each core. Okay. And especially at that the first first couple of months, she sticks around the research core more because of the um, because of her spiritualism abilities. Hence why Barry knows her more. Okay. Because she's interacted with that core the most, and also they they were the ones who sort of judged her. The I mean, that's fair. They are the ones the most likely to have weird magic and idiosyncrasies about them. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jessica just says, yeah, she she started out as part of the uh, scouts, but very quickly switched over to the Chris Tex and the Engineer Corps just because she's got some magic about her. So, you know, uh, we borrow her for expeditions and so on because she's a great shot and her magic comes in handy for sure. But she's a... Uh, Really just got more of a research head on her shoulders, to be honest. I suppose that's fair. She seems like she could use um, maybe a vacation or two. Or ten. Oh boy, don't you know it. Uh... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know you're on, I know you're on duty and all, but don't you have any, I don't know, more festive beverages or things like that around here? How festive are we talking? Are we talking get a little shit face to the bar? Or are we talking you're not going to remember when you wake up? Jessica, I wouldn't have you fired from your position, as it were. We need you to be here the next day and not on the cliffside or lost in the middle of the woods. Oh. I am I am definitely more the type for waking up in trees than you, I feel. Debatable. We, we might have to do a count to see. Um, but... No, I mean, I haven't been fired yet. I doubt they're going to fire me now. I'll have to talk to you a little bit later about a nightcap. How about that? You got it. Well, I think the sounds of laughter from around us might have helped a little bit this evening, so. Mm -hmm. Everybody's, uh, there's a bit of a tension break, we'll say. Um, at this point in time, we'll say it broaches into the evening. So is there anything anyone would like to do before sleep happens? Yes. 
uh, Barry would like to perform a little bit of um, Christic magic. Okay. What I would are you like to. Christic? I would like to. I would like to find Barry before he does the magic thing, and I okay. say, um, "Hey, Barry." Yeah. Oh, it it looks like I'm interrupting, so I'll try to keep this brief. Would you mind um, meeting me at our usual place at the usual time? Wait, can you do that? Uh, I can, yes. Okay. Then I would be happy for you to. I have something I think you might also find interesting. Um, before you go, and Barry um, is currently tapping the lantern frame for um, any part that sounds... Um, what do you call it? Aesthetically pleasing. Tapping it, you said? Yeah, with a with a piece of um with like a uh what do you call those things? A sonic fork. Ah. Oh tuning fork. The tuning fork. Yeah. The tuning uh, fork, that's correct. Yeah, you Sonic can, Fork. You you can see, you can certainly um find a spot that gives you an appropriate tone for what you're looking um, for. I then take a chisel, and I chip a piece from that part of the lantern. Interesting. Um, I'm going to say red or black. Uh, I'm going to go black again. You're getting good on those guesses tonight. You chip this piece off, and... It gave you a bit of a brighter tone than you anticipated. When you chip this piece, you realize it's not copper. Like it should be. It is effectively a piece of weathered brass made to look copper. And you kind of hold it and you're like, Okay, but brass doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't hold a magical charge. It won't take a rune. And it's just curious to you. I think I've stumbled onto something by accident. You see, Rumine, most um, lanterns are made of copper. It's fairly in tune with aether, which means that it conducts that energy very well. This lantern is made of brass. It does not conduct Aether at all. Now, if I remember correctly, brass is copper and zinc, so it's something about the alloy of zinc that um, yeah. cuts the connection. Yeah, that is brass. Yeah. World building. Um, but yes, moving on. Which means this isn't the lantern. And someone still has the whole thing. Or something worse. Someone turned, someone transmuted the lantern and ruined its etheric properties. Still, though, it is rather harmonic, so, um, and he hands the sliver of brass to Rumine. Would you mind striking that with a bit of lightning? Hmm. 
okay, um, well, where do we want to put it? Because I would hate to hit anyone else with that. Um, he points to like a, a flat, a, a, a large flat stone. There should be good. Okay. I put the piece of brass on top of the stone. Open the fan. And um, this is going to be uh, one of a few moments that we get to find that, that we get to learn things about this fan. All right, then, Fu, time to do your thing. Okay. And we and we call for lightning. It's a small bolt. You know, uh, I'm not going to make you make a check for this because it it's it is what it is. You you strike a small shard of brass with lightning. All right. Um, I go and retrieve the piece of brass after it looks like it's cooled down for a moment. Mm -hmm. All right, Barry. Is this what you were looking for? Yes, thank you. Since it's brass, it doesn't very it doesn't uh, conduct etheric energy all that well, um, and it's not iron, so it won't magnetize. But we do get an ambient ele electronic field just because the lightning. Uh, he takes the brass sliver and sandwiches it between the two right crystals um, and then he wraps them in the copper wire uh, I and then see where takes you're going that hole he he then takes that whole um, rig and um, jams it into the uh, wider end of the scepter oh, sorry the walking stick he's made very clever um and then along the length of this walking stick he starts um uh writing runes um that uh i'll be back in just a second i can still hear you Um, to, what's the word, um, uh, increase, what do you call it, um, increase the etheric connection between this piece of brass and the lantern and hopefully the etherite crystal that was in the lantern. Okay. Oh. I'm going to ask you, um... I'm going to ask you to make a skill check and we're going to see just this is more going to be to determine the accuracy of this dousing rod you've built. Um, so the should you succeed, it will be fairly accurate and fairly quick to detect uh, the crystal should it be around. And if you don't, it'll still help, but it will take you significantly more time. So, uh, I'll let you pick what kind of magic you're using to make this check. Um, this is a very I... interesting combination of things. I'm going to use Geomancy for this one. Okay. I'll set this at a two difficulty. Um, just because you are you are a craftsman, this isn't necessarily difficult, but it is... A fairly complex application of your magical skill, not necessarily your, um, uh, we'll say construction skills. Well, I mean, you got to do what you can without a workshop. Exactly. Um, and I have pulled two jack. Jeez. Okay. You don't even need to do any cascades or anything. You had me beat with one of them. 
Um, so you you get a very good charge off of this. You get the sense you're probably going to have to like walk the length of the caravan to see if it has a reaction in any particular area. But it should work. You're, you're confident in the magic you've woven here. Um, does it have a magnetic pull? Uh, is, is what I would like to know. Like, um, I realize that, uh, brass itself is not magnetic, but with the application of this being a dowsing rod, um, it's... does it happen to pull towards? It actually, uh... it's not magnetic in nature. It is vibrational in nature. So the ah. closer you get to, if there is a crystal around, to this crystal, you will hear sort of an echo of the tuning fork you were using to originally create this piece, but louder. Great. So you get more of a radar ah. ping than a, a magnetic hook. And does it vibrate when it's near the brass um, lantern frame? Yes, significantly weaker, but it does, because of that sympathetic binding. Great. I think I may have found a way to find our lantern, Aetherite. You are muted, Sin. And with your help. Well, thank you for, for that, although... I feel that our dilemma might have a bit more to it than that. Oh, oh. Well, at least for now. Um, but at the very the, least, the if, the person, if the person who has stolen things is among us in this caravan, then they're a bold individual for one. But for two... At least you'll be able to find them. Exactly. So. With that, I think we're going to move on to the evening slash um, possibly sleep, depending on how you all are uh, prepping to communicate with each other. Oh, I'm going to bed. Uh, getting the entire conversational track that uh, Rue and Alyssa had, yeah, she's also going to bed. Nobody spots where she goes to sleep. It's it's always different, and it's always, like, really far off. What, they couldn't um, find the trail of feathers? <laughs> probably, <laughs> at this point. But most of the feathers have just been left in the cart where she was cleaning the cleaning earlier and just oh. the idea of making them fe fletching has probably just left shortly uh, before i go to bed or before rue goes to bed um i would find danica and um tell her i think i'll see you at the same place today that i normally see you or i suppose where i would be seeing you if i weren't here probably that seems to be um, where I found you the most. Never thought of just how sneaky being able to dreamwalk would make y'all. Me. It, it's a me thing. Um, it is a you thing. Through thing. Yes. So. But yeah, like, when I, like... Me is like me splayed out on top of a whole bunch of hay. Like I'm an absolute like unceremonious mess while sleeping. <laughs> Very well. The dreams begin. Rue, whom would you like to visit first? And go and find a berry first. Um. So in real life. After Barry found a replacement for his watch that night, um, he went to go sit in front of um, a tree and wrapped himself in its roots um, in order to meditate. 
And so in the dream realm, Barry would stand under a very large, um, a very large oak tree that sort of dominates this part of the forest. Very well. When I go to retrieve Alyssa for the first time, instead of going into, I like walk into her dream space. And then I ask her to take a walk with me and I try to walk her out of the dream space that she has. Um, my reason being that is a special spot for her. I don't think it's a place that she would want unwelcome visitors. That's fair. And it's a bit of an odd experience for you, um, Danica, because it's a bit like, oh, you're in your workshop, you're comfortable. And then Rue opens mm -hmm. the door and what should be outside your workshop door isn't there. Instead, you just see the infinite forest, the realm of dreams. And it's just a bit odd. And you know, like you've dreamt of opening that door before. And every time you've opened it, it has just been an extension of whatever you were dreaming of. But this time you just see the forest for what it's it just, is. It's we're going to take a hike. If you don't mind. I mean, honestly, at this point, weirder things have happened. That's fine. And she kind of I'll hold my arm out to you. Like. <laughs> Welcome to the woods. With the music I have playing right now, it's like a much darker introduction of Dorothy to Wizard of Oz. <laughs> There's a whole because there is no out. tornado and it's only the woods. Mm -hmm. A little bit like into the woods, actually. A little bit. Uh, yeah. uh, not, uh, not too far uh, off. I think you would potentially come across a clearing where Danica, you don't really see much beyond how you would normally see. Um, we're having a bit of an echo. There we go. Um, from you would normally see Alyssa. Rue, you see something very different. Being of the nature you are, you see what Alyssa is dreaming, whereas Danica, you see how you know Alyssa to be now. <laughs> Am I aware that this difference exists? Yes. Yes. That basically Danica can see, like, sees Alyssa differently than I do? Mm-hmm. Okay. Important to know. I just kind of look at Alyssa um, to say, you know, kind of give a knowing, a knowing nod, but I don't say anything. Um, when everybody's convened, I go... I think this would be the safest way to explain what I'm about to tell you. And I I figure this is like the dream realm, so you can just do whatever you like. I can do whatever I want, technically speaking. Um, I manifest a slight, a slight, a snow globe that's a little bit larger than, than hand-sized. Okay. Okay. I'm still getting that. Snow... Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I don't make the rules here. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um. So in the in the snow globe, I materialize a picture of the town of um, Twin Creeks. And then I just kind of look around to see if, like, recognition is happening. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I went looking for this tower to find out what happened here. But I learned something else. 
you see like the patterns of the town and stuff like swirl around and you see this dark area in the woods near the town you see a pair of statues you see like a number of creatures you see people putting stones into uh, like putting these uh, dark looking crystals into statues mm -hmm. um and then you see kind of like a, kind of a vortex of some kind appear and all of the creatures disappear except for a single figure and there is a brief zoom in on this figure wearing um really particular clothing but you can't like see what their facial features are or anything like recognizable like that but um after looking at that for a moment there's more swirling shapes and you're back at town in a particular farmhouse where a flame giant is with a crystal that crystal turns really dark then the darkness starts spreading into the arm of this creature, turning it crystal just like it is and manifesting a sword. So, funny enough, I would like to note that Alyssa, well, Danica sees Alyssa as how she normally presents in the waking world. I feel like and Mary and Rue probably see Alyssa as how she was dreaming. Just given their connection. I I would. Yeah, definitely Rue would, but I'm pretty sure Barry would as well, due to being in a vineyard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do either of you know where this clothing comes from or what kind of people wear them? Or what kind of magic this is? Um, so, for GM knowledge, uh, none of you would know what kind of magic this is. Because it's sort of, it's that idea of like, it is magic beyond the current rules of magic as you understand them. Um, on the other side of things... The clothing would stand out as, you know, to, to any of you with any historical knowledge, so to speak, it would stand out as old. It would stand out as um, potentially rich, uh, well-made, especially to last this long. And it would stand out as um, definitely something that wouldn't be made on the plateau, but perhaps would have been passed down though you are seeing it very far and away from the plateau to conceptualize it so it's a thing that's like definitely you might see something like it but it would have had to be a family heirloom no that clothing is old outdated like the way it's woven and embroidered um it's probably not even on this continent well i have a concern about this person the specifics aside although i it would help us to know someone well that part from what i was able to gather isn't necessarily close to the town In other words, the Bane Horde that we saw aren't necessarily, didn't necessarily walk up there by normal means. It would have taken them a little while longer to do. They were brought here. Aside from, I suppose, normal things, what would Twin Creeks, what would Twin Creeks have done to warrant an enemy like that. Who can say? The Bane Horde are incredibly smart, intelligent. They follow 
a hierarchy, much like the Gleam Wardens. It's and like Alyssa just falls very quiet after that. The magic they are using is beyond our kiss and kiss. I think they might be aware or be connected to the disappearance of this beacon. The timing is far too specific. Those moments you saw, the moments that we walked into with the giant that you buried, and only a brief, precious few moments before you noticed that, you know, a few moments after, you noticed that the energy of the beacon itself was missing. Indeed. This was a very elaborate plan. I uh, think hi. The Bane Horde are organized, but I feel that this might be a bit larger than them. Wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't be surprised. Their generals are smart enough and human enough. They could sway anybody into helping. It is at this point in this evening when you all are startled by a new voice. Well, hello there, little dreamers. And you turn you turn, pardon me, uh, to see a figure step from under the shadowy mouths of this forest. A figure who, Danica, you don't recognize, but you, you see a similarity to, I'll say. But it is exceedingly, exceedingly different where the figure you would have expected to meet from one of the dreaming courts wore a cloak patterned in starlight and wore sort of bright gold uh, eye shadow with auburn hair. This figure does not wear a cloak patterned in starlight. They wear starlight. This figure's skin melds into their clothing and you see nebulas and stars and galaxies swirl from one portion to the next. Their eyes are simply color. They are formless, and yet they are bright and curious. Their face is somewhat thin, you know, high cheekbones, fairly, um, fairly fey in appearance. And their hair looks as though it were spider silk reflecting in an early morning sun. And they say, It is a curious crowd who walks by wood this night. And curious things you speak of. Though I recommend you would all get your true rest. Or darker things walk these woods now. And stranger times are yet ahead. Rest well, true. That workers. I can agree on. And this figure walks past you all as though they just stopped for a chat on the side of the road. And they walk past you into the woods. And I believe that's where we'll end today, because we are getting towards the end of our time. Actually, I think we're over. 
Well, we start out a bit late. Listen, we had to give the people the content that they came for. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, how y'all feel? What are you thinking? A nice little mellow session? Oh, was, this was nice and mellow, and then it's kind of like... <laughs> I I wasn't going to give you encounters or drama, but I wasn't just going to let it all be nice and calm. See, and when you, but when I said you were lying, you just looked at me like, whatever do you mean? Whatever do you mean? No. <laughs> me? No. Never. <laughs> I love a good RP session. But that said, uh, let's get to this outro. So, oh no, we lost. We lost a radio. What? What did she do? Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing attempted to mute and otherwise missed. But uh, we are for the most part okay. Press the wrong button. We are for the most part okay. Uh, <laughs> most of our captures are still somewhat visible. So, um, thank you for joining us, everyone who is in chat. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> THC content Corbett has struck again. Very true, <laughs> though. I. No, I can't even resent the nickname. Um, that said, uh, thank you for joining us once again. This episode has been brought to you by RPG Hour. You can go find them through this card link. Go check out their other shows. Uh, a few of which um, our castmates and myself are a part of as well. And uh, once again, the wonderful soundscapes tonight, especially that uh, the Infinite Woods uh soundtrack that i was playing are brought to you by sirenscape also there's ether merch available and you can find the game with the exclamation point gtrpg command he so, needs to show you the back of that hoodie oh yeah ow that was my knee um it's got the ether logo on it which is Ta -da! Ta -da! Um, so yeah, you can find these at eldritchcrow.com slash uh shop i believe it is slash shop or slash store, whichever works. And um, thank you for joining us, everyone. And we will be back in two weeks. So until then, I do hope you all enjoy. And um, well, let's just say uh, have some interesting dreams, shall we? Goodbye, everyone. And we go there and we go.